Hey, good morning, everyone. You know, I, I'm Gil Wolf, and um, I'm a neuromuscular neurologist. I'm here at University of Buffalo. I'm a professor. I run the department. I'm joined by my esteemed colleague, who also has a strong interest in myasthenia gravis, Nick Silvestri. And uh, Nick, besides being a, a professor of neurology, um, shortly, um, he's, uh, he's also the assistant dean for student affairs here. So Nick, tell everybody hello. Good morning, everyone. Nice to be here with you all. So we're going to talk about something in the area of treatment of myasthenia gravis, a recent paper done by our close colleague not too far away at the University of Toronto, Vera Brill's group. And her group actually has done probably the best work from a masked randomized standpoint of immunoglobulin in myasthenia gravis. And so this is kind of a furtherance of some of that initial work. This was actually a multi-center study that was just published. Um, and it's looking at a big question that I've had and many others have had in myasthenia gravis. What are we getting out of IVIG specifically? So immunoglobulin therapy as a maintenance therapy in myasthenia gravis, because it's used fairly frequently for that. Although I will interject now, I think it's gonna be used less frequently because we have some newer agents, but this has been a question. And just as a backdrop, before I get into the paper and Nick adds his thoughts, realize the effect of immunoglobulin in myasthenia gravis from that group versus placebo. Now this was in worsening patients with myasthenia gravis was pretty modest. In fact, they really only saw a response if your QMG was 11 points or above. That was um, uh, uh, um, Zinman's study, but uh, uh, Vera was driving that study with their team back in 2007. And then they did a subsequent study in somewhat a more tougher population of IVIG versus plasma exchange, again, in a worsening environment in MG, and found them basically to be equivalent. Maybe plasma exchange was just a touch better, but from a statistical from a statistical standpoint, they were equivalent. So now we have this paper here, and I'm just gonna summarize it real quick. So, um, uh, and this was published in Neurology in the AAN's journal. And uh, I, I think they'll, they'll provide it for you um, as far as the actual reference, but it was published in uh, 2023, just a few, uh, uh, a couple months ago. Um, so what they did here, they did not require any kind of QMG basement level, which could be one of the weaknesses, but they are just taking patients who are corticosteroid dependent. And obviously reducing steroids is a very important thing in MG. Nick, do you want to interject why it's important? I mean, I, I think it you know speaks for itself, Gil. I mean, steroids have a whole litany of side effects, uh, you know, both in the short and the long term. And I think it's obviously a really real goal of ours in order to try to get people off of steroids to spare them from that burden of treatment. And the Japanese data has shown that if you can really get them to a pretty low level, lower than I was trained to get people to, and we're talking about five milligrams of prednisolone, which is dose equivalent to pre prednisone, five milligrams or less a day, so 10 every other day would be an equivalent to that. There you really see fewer side effects, and, uh, and as far as quality of life, it's better. But that's getting to a pretty, pretty low level of prednisone. So that's an effort with this study is to see how well we can reduce corticosteroids in 60 patients with myasthenia gravis. They were MGFA class two through 4A, so that's mild to severe generalized patients. And the dosing that they used for the IVIG was just like the I study in CIDP, two grams per kilogram initially, followed by one gram per kilogram every three weeks. Nick, I think that's a pretty good dose. What do you think about that? Yeah, no, I think so too. I mean, you know, when I use IVIG in myasthenia, which isn't all that often, I mean, I certainly use that same induction dose, but I actually... Uh, personally use two grams per kilogram every four weeks for three rounds. And then I try to dose adjust from there. So I perhaps use a little bit more than in the study, but uh, not that not that far off. So they followed the patients for um, 36 weeks and then they did the steroid assessment. The primary outcome was steroid sparing, which is tough in MG. It is a tough outcome measure. They did that at 39 weeks. Maybe that wasn't long enough, but We'll get through the details of the study here in just a second. They reduced prednisone somewhat similar to the way we did it in the thymectomy trial. Um, you know, it was about five or 10 milligrams every three weeks, as long as patients seem stable. Um, the dividing line as far as the reduction between 10 and five milligrams was if they were less than 40 a day, 40 milligrams a day, then it was then it got down to decrements of five milligrams. 
we did a similar scheme in the thymectomy trial. If patients worse and they'd use the QMG to grade that, QMG increases, increases in all these scales that we commonly use in MG, mean the disease is worse. If it increased by four points, then they had to adjust back up the prednisone dose. And the other important thing that they did is there were some dropouts. They included the dropouts in their final analysis, which I think is important because otherwise, if you take that out, it really could lead to skepticism about their final results. So that's sort of the basis of, of uh, uh, th that. those are the basic things that they did in the study. Then they looked at a few other outcomes that I'll mention. So anything you want to add to that before I just go through some of the, 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 the results? All right, so these were the results. Versus placebo, did IVIG help you reduce steroids? And they were looking for a 50% reduction from the baseline dose at week 39 again. Not quite a year, but close to it. No, IVIG did not help you reduce steroids versus placebo. 60% of the IVIG recipients and 63%, a slightly higher uh, uh, percentage of the placebo recipients, both hit that 50% reduction. Nick, your initial thoughts on that. I'm not surprised. Were you surprised by that? No, I mean, I think the steroid sparing outcome has failed in pretty much any study I can think of, save maybe the thymectomy trial, right? And I actually was really impressed with the placebo rate. I mean, obviously, most trials with myasthenia are susceptible to placebo uh, uh, effect, but uh, it actually was pretty eye-opening to me that 60% of patients with placebo actually met the outcome. And they even included patients, I think it was a requirement that there had been a prior taper right. attempt right. to go into the study as well. So. Anyway, I mean, they, I think they kind of loaded the study to try to show a difference from that standpoint, and still they couldn't do that. All right. That, you know, these were patients who were pretty dependent on steroids and then trying to, to, to see if IVIG really would help us reduce that. Um, you know, other things that I thought were maybe a little bit more surprising, although I wasn't really that surprised by the results of this. Again, as I prefaced, the impact of IVIG has been relatively modest. In fact, that initial Zinman study I mentioned even had an editorial, how much bang for the buck are we getting out of, uh, uh, out of IVIG? Matt Mergioli, our, our colleague, uh, uh, wrote that editorial. There was no difference in the time to first worsening, whether you got IVIG or not. I was a little surprised maybe by that. Nick, were you surprised? I thought maybe IVIG would protect you from that. And it really didn't protect you at all from crises. I agree. I thought that was a pretty surprising finding. By the way, there was one death from MG in both arms, uh, uh, both the placebo and the IVIG arm. There were actually more discontinuations, maybe not surprising because IVIG can cause some side effects. There were more discontinuations um, in the IVIG group than placebo. Interestingly, of those discontinuations, four were because of MG problems in the IVIG group, just one in the placebo group as far as MG worsening. All right. Anything you want to add to the results before we start talking about some of the other things? No, I mean, I think the, the one other thing I would add about the results was the finding that uh, patients that were on 20 milligrams or higher of prednisone per day uh, were more likely to have that 50 percent reduction than those that were on lower doses. So, you know, in terms of like trying to spare people from the you know overall dose, I mean, there's, it's probably not a true linear effect with side effects and dosage, uh, but it was heartening at least to see that patients on higher doses were able to come down a little bit more than those on lower doses. Yeah, not fully agree. And so what does this paper add? I mean, this is our first randomized, blinded, evaluator-blinded data of what IVIG does over time, at least from the standpoint of steroid reduction in this group of myasthenia gravis patients, generalized, mild to severe generalized patients. You know, some of the limitations of the study, um, they allowed both daily and every other day dosing. I really don't think that's a big deal. In the thymectomy study, and that was partially because the NINDS required it, we were only allowed every other day dosing. That, that doesn't bother me too much. Um, could dosing changes of corticosteroids prior to that one month before entry, it had to be stable for a month before they went in. Could that have maybe impacted these results, you know, that they boosted the dosing, say six weeks before or whatever. And so, you know, we know steroids generally work in myasthenia gravis because that have had some impact. There's really not data in the, uh, in the paper to, to, to really uh, uh, further elucidate that. Maybe, as I mentioned before, was this not a long enough wait? When we have seen steroid 
sparing effects in MG, it's always been after a year that I can think of. The azathioprine study of the thymectomy trial, we had three years. The azathioprine study followed patients up to three years as well, and they really didn't start seeing an impact until maybe 18 months. That could have been an issue. And then the other thing is, as I mentioned before, does IVIG have much impact on milder patients? It doesn't seem to, from the data that we have, they didn't have a QMG basement requirement that may have further loaded the study to see a, a, an effect. Nick, do you have any other thoughts on the limitations? No, I mean, I think those are all adequately uh, or, or well well described. I mean, um, I am a little bit surprised, though. I mean, I, I totally, you know, fully understand that most of the uh, quote-unquote steroid sparing agents we use, azathioprine, uh, mycophenolate, thymectomy, and one uh, do take time to take effect. I was a little surprised by that when it came to IVIG, because I typically think of IVIG as one of the, you know, more fast-acting uh, uh, therapies in myasthenia. In fact, I know many people use it for exacerbation, and some people even use it for crisis. So that was a little surprising to me. Yeah. Now, that's a good point that this is kind of a faster acting agent than what we think about, say, with the methotrexates or the uh, mycophenolates and so forth. Well, we have seen failures in steroid sparing, but we know those drugs work quite slowly. And again, we think IVIG is working quicker. All right. Implications for clinicians. You know, it really does raise the question what we're getting out of all this maintenance therapy that we're doing with IVIG and myasthenia gravis. You know, I was part of a study that showed that MG really is about the second to third most common disease out there as far as, say, home infusion companies giving immunoglobulin to people at home. Uh, um, CIDP, I think, was number one. But anyway, it, it is commonly used. Again, because of these newer agents coming on board, I think it's used as a maintenance therapy or even as a bridge therapy to get patients better before maybe, say, a steroid sparing agent is having effect. I think the use of IVIG or even subcutaneous IG may wane to some degree. But the other implication I wanted to mention on this is two others. First of all, IVIG does not seem versus placebo to help keep your patients out of potential trouble. At least this trial did not show that. And then the other thing is be very cautious about that final reduction in prednisone to zero, because that's where they saw a good number of the patients going into exacerbations or crises was when they went, and that was up to actually the uh, uh, clinician's discretion. Did they have to go down from that five milligram step all the way to zero? Sometimes they did, and that's where patients got into trouble. And so, again, in kind of a, a, a time frame of, say, eight months or so, be very cautious about getting patients to absolute zero on prednisone. Yes, we want to get there. But again, the Japanese have shown you really can be quite safe with, now these are low doses, but five a day or 10 every other day. So be cautious because whatever that tiny dose is doing, it seems to be doing something. And when you get to zero, patients could get into trouble. Any other implications that you have uh, that you want to mention, Nick? No, no, Gil. I would say this is really consistent with my clinical experience in terms of IVIG. I mean, whereas IVIG tends to be very efficacious in, in uh, some other disorders like CIDP, for example, uh, my experience with IVIG in myasthenia has been pretty much hit or miss. Uh, and, you know, there's a lot of side effects of IVIG too that patients struggle with. So I agree with your comments in terms of uh, you know, where the future of IVIG treatment in myasthenia going forward will be. And I also agree in terms of, you know, that, that quote unquote terminal prednisone taper. Uh, it, it's just funny how some patients are just dependent on five milligrams a day, which physiologically makes very little sense to me, but uh, it is what it is. And as you point out, our colleagues, Dr. Itsugasawa, Dr. Marai, and others in Japan have shown um, that it's, you know, safe and effective time and again. So perhaps uh, five milligrams, uh, uh, you know, is the way to go uh, with regard to prednisone. Yeah. You know, that's been actually in several discussions of several papers. What is this tiny dose doing? We really don't understand that well at all. But so anyway, that was kind of a nice uh, segue into the, the final points we want to discuss, which what comes next? And uh, Nick, do you have some thoughts about that? I'll give uh, uh, my little piece after yours. Yeah, I mean, I, I think, you know, you kind of already touched on this, Gail. I mean, I think that, you know, based on this uh, this study and other studies, frankly, in our clinical experience, you know, one wonders with all the other uh, therapies that are available and will be available to treat myasthenia, where what is the role of IVIG going forward? Uh, my experience over the past year or so has been that sometimes payers will require a trial of IVIG before moving on to some of these therapies. And I hope that results like this really uh, allow um, allow us to not maybe use it, uh, you know, as a step therapy if these other therapies are more efficacious and beneficial to our patients. 
That, that's a great point. And then the other thing, which I did briefly mention before, we have a plethora of other agents. We have three agents that have been approved since 2017 in Myas Theta Gravis. Now, granted, they were approved based on changes in MGADL and so forth. The MGADL was the primary outcome. It's a, a, a patient reported outcome in Myas Theta Gravis. But from the open label extensions in these trials, we have some evidence that these newer agents, which are C5 cleavage inhibitors, FCRN antagonists, that they have some role in reducing steroids. Um, and so um, we don't have you know, formal randomized type data uh, from that standpoint, but my sense is these agents are gonna be replacing to some degree IVIG in that attempt again to steroid spare and uh, reduce the steroid requirements in our MG patients. And perhaps we'll have some formal studies that actually do show that with more rigorous data. Um, and so that really caps what I uh, wanted to get across. Nick, I don't know if you have any final comments. I wanna thank everybody for joining us and Nick, send us off. Yeah, no, thanks very much. It's been a pleasure to discuss this article with you, Gil. And um, I wish everyone on the, uh, on the call well and uh, have a great day. Yeah, and I hope to see a bunch of you in Boston. And Nick and I, a week from today, we'll be discussing something completely different in this <laughs> course that we do. <laughs> That'll be on a neuropathic pain. But thanks for joining us on this discussion of what we're actually getting out of immunoglobulin therapy as a steroid sparer in our patients with generalized myasthenia gravis. Thanks again.